would pray for dad to come back to the church. How can he not believe anymore? He's breaking his promise to me, to God. I would say, please, please, please bless that dad will come back to the church. What happens if I don't believe anymore? Is she still going to love him either way I am? But now I kind of feel like we can have a better connection now that he's not in the church. I wish this was a bad All right, let's, uh, we're going to start with an opening. Wait, no. <laughs> ah, I was ready. Um, I usually started off with, uh, welcome to, let's try this again. Welcome to An Equally Yoke. I am Neil Winters. I'm Naomi. And we are joined today by Sage and Rachel Turk. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're very excited to be here. Yes, yeah. I heard Thank you, you last week on Infants on Thrones and was like, I've got to, I've got to get these guys on, so. Your yeah, it's been, it's been a whirlwind of a week, but we are so happy to be here, so. All right, well, um, I think, I don't want to go into the whole reason why you were on infants. I'm sure people have heard it, but we'll, we'll, we'll work our way up to that. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, Sounds so. Good. I guess let's start off with the generic question. What, what is your background in the LDS church and, um, how did you meet and all that fun stuff? Oh, good. Okay. Well, I think we've managed to reduce this down to like a four hour long story. So oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready. So I guess, uh, I'll start. I'm going to, I am really bad about letting Rachel speak. <laughs> so if you hear a slapping noise, it's her just kind of beating the side of my head to <laughs> let me know that I should stop. But I'll, I'll just say in general. So we were both born in the church. Okay. Um, very, very active, both of us, our, our whole lives. And then I met her, uh, while I was serving my mission in Salt Lake City. So she was visiting her family while she was at college. And I met her at a holiday party and we started writing and kind of fell in love via letter. And we were married three months later, out, uh, three months after my mission. <laughs> <laughs> Scandalous. So, um, who prayed first about, like, did you pray on your mission about marrying her, or did you wait until you get, got home? I think my mom was the first one that prayed about it. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, her, her mom orchestrated this whole thing. No. No, she, um, I think we, it was kind of a mutual thing, like, it's, it's pretty amazing. Just, I think when you're young and naive and just ready to love, like, it, it can just happen so easily. Yeah. And so, missionaries are just so alluring, right? <laughs> True. Yeah. Forbidden fruit. So. <laughs> what was the first thing that attracted you to say, Rachel? <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, that first time we talked, he wouldn't look at me because he was, he was a good missionary. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to look at girls. <laughs> He looked down at the ground, and I was like, "That's so cute." Aww. So she, yeah, You're such a good mission. So I was so awkward and unable to communicate with her. That's what just made her fall in love. Yeah. No, I said I was like, "Oh, he's a good missionary. He's he's not gonna look." So. What kind of shoes was she wearing? <laughs> well, there are these really cute black pumps. <laughs> It's kind of funny, we wrote, we wrote, so we started writing each other and it was very platonic. It was just talking about, uh, you know, spiritual things and just kind of, cause I was asking her about school. That was kind of my way in. <laughs> cause I was thinking about going to Utah State where she was going. Uh -huh. Cause I was serving, you know, you're, two, you're there for two years so you can get in-state tuition. Oh, oh, that's smart. Really? Yeah. That's the pro tip. If you serve in Salt Lake City, you can go to school in Utah for cheaper. And you, and you don't have to choose BYU. You don't have to go to BYU, yeah. <laughs> uh, and we actually, so we were writing, and it was literally the first time I had decided to sign, like, to sign off the letter with love. Like, love, Elder Turk, which just sounds crazy, but I sent the mail, the letter off, and literally the, like, the next day, which means she hadn't even gotten it, I got the letter from her, which is the first time she had signed off. With love, oh, Rachel. Sweet. Yep. So, <laughs> totally meant to be. Yep. Didn't even, didn't even need to pray about it. And, <laughs> and where are you from originally, Sage? 
uh, all over the place, but I, uh, Oregon, mostly. What, what part? The Oregon coast, Newport. Oh, okay. I was hoping it was Bend, because that's the one place in Oregon I've been. <laughs> that's where my mom lives. Oh, so really? We're very, yeah. we're intimately, well, I probably shouldn't use that word very often <laughs> in this context. We are familiar with Bend. <laughs> yeah, I was there, uh, with my first accounting job, working on a client that had, like, some sort of a, Special technology for working with hydrogen to create uh, elect- electricity. Wow! Yeah. Did you ever uh, Did you ever float down the river? No, no. I was there in the winter. Night that's, that's, that's one into two thousand and two. So it's been a bit. Well, that's no excuse. You still should have floated down the river. Uh, I should have. <laughs> well, and then the other Not thing. Ice is, float. I, th- this was when I was, you know, very. I was fresh. Well, we were, I was fresh into the new career and I was working with some, some, uh, auditors from, um, the, or, uh, Portland and they asked me if I wanted to go skiing on Sunday and I was like, no, I can't do that. And now I would have, now I'm like, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, <laughs> hindsight 2020. Yeah. Anyway, don't look at me like that, Naomi. I, don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, anything else exciting about about you guys that we need to know? Like, let's do this. Sage, you have to tell us one interesting thing about Rachel, and Rachel, one inter- interesting thing about Sage. Okay, how much trouble do I want to get into? <laughs> um... Okay, an interesting thing about Rachel is, uh, she, she found it necessary to prove to me that she met a, a obscure character from <laughs> Star Trek Deep Space Nine <laughs> when she was a kid and has spent the last week searching for a photograph to show me. Oh, <laughs> and she did it. She proved, she, she proved found it. that it happened. So. Was it Whoopi Goldberg? But it's no. not obscure. Oh. It's Otto. Yeah, from, it's like some shape-shifting guy from, from Deep Space Nine, Deep which Space is just Deep Space Nine, like, okay. Yeah, you were, you were a next gen, gen. Yeah, I like next gen. That was, that was me too, yeah, like every Sunday. That was our family <laughs> thing, was watch Star Trek. I, we, we, uh, sorry I'm full of stories tonight, but when we were in college, we got selected to do, um, a Nielsen rating survey. And one of my comments was, because this was when it was in syndication on Fox 13, and uh, I made it a point to tell them that they needed to keep it going. <laughs> Single, single-handedly single fighting the fight. Yeah. Okay, Rachel, your turn. Oh, okay. Well, Sage is he's really creative, and... Uh, he has written a couple of children's books that we just kind of published ourselves, you know, just like using those like photo book things. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and one of them is called, what is it called? Pretty, pretty chinsess? Yeah, pretty, pretty chinsess. Oh, and he, he it. used himself as the model for the pretty chinsess. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you know when you turn your face upside down, you put like eyeballs on your chin. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. that, but it's in a dress. And he, uh, so one day he was outside, like taking pictures of himself, like doing all these different faces. I'm like, what is he doing? <laughs> just like, uh, you know, when you're when you're married to a creative type, you just mm-hmm. learn to not ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm always super embarrassed about it, so she thinks, like, the worst is happening. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. No, no. Um, just, just making the kids' book. My boys would love that book. So here's, <laughs> here's the thing. You're on a podcast. Like, what, is it on Amazon? We can, we can plug this, you know? Yeah. There's literally Look two copies there. of it in the entire world. And they're both in our house. <laughs> they're both in our house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if our listeners want a copy of it, um, email me and... Uh, We'll work it out. We'll work it out. What are the, what are the, what's the price? Like $200 a piece? I yep. mean, there's only two copies. Oh, there's, su- yeah, there's super collector's editions. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can, can you put a price tag on something no. like that? No. No. You can't. No. 
<laughs> <laughs> so Sage and Rachel, you met on the mission three months after Sage gets home. You get married. Or mm-hmm. you get engaged? No, we got we got engaged like a week after he got off his okay. mission. So three months after you get married. Yep. Tail is all this time. Yep. And then, how many kids do you have? We have we have the complete set. We have a boy and a girl. Oh. Lucky and a uh, dog. <laughs> no pets. No pets. Nothing. No pet type animals here. Guess you're not American. We're not. <laughs> no. We both grew, we grew up and we knew that we did to our parents what we knew our kids would do to us, which is like, yeah, we'll take care of it. Right. No, not. <laughs> uh-uh. So how long have you been married? This year will be 12. 12 years. We'll be celebrating our 12th in like a week. Congratulations. Thanks. Which is, yes, yeah, super, super crazy. And what about, what about you guys? I should probably know this because I've stopped so many of your episodes, but. <laughs> We are coming up uh April on 19, 19 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, we... We have five kids. We have five kids. But we met... We didn't meet on my mission. We met after my mission and were engaged within a week and married about two and a half or three months later. So. Yeah. Oh, so there you go, yeah. <laughs> yep. You're part of the club. Congrats. Okay. Okay. It's a proven model. Okay, so... At what point in your marriage, how long have you guys been married when you both started individually questioning things? Do you want to go first? Okay, sure. Seniority. I'm mm-hmm. the head of this household, so I shall go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm only getting away with this because I have an audience. <laughs> um, Meals the same way. <laughs> I get real brave when there's other people in the room. So I I started, I was the first to start questioning uh, because of my mission. And that's mainly just, I, I mean, so serving in Salt Lake City is just a trip. And, you know, we I, I was just so ill-prepared for the types of things that people would bring up because, I mean, I, I had gone to, so I had gone to BYU-Idaho for my first year of college. Oh, wow. Before my mission, and I had like a really good like seminary uh, or institute, sorry, teacher there, and he was kind of like I thought he was like preparing me for a mission because he would bring up some of kind of the silly things that anti Mormons or things would say, and I thought I was like ready to to handle it, but you know he'd say things like, "Oh yeah, you know I went on my mission in the South, and they thought Mormons had horns, and so I showed him my head, and I was like, "Look, no horns, ha ha ha, that's what you'll get." <laughs> <laughs> and then I go into the mission field, and like on my first day, I hear just like everything, like just all the craziest stuff. So, but it didn't, I mean, it was one of those things that you kind of, I don't know, you hear, but you're more, you're just in the mindset to, to find a way to argue it or to ignore it or whatever. But did make an impression. I didn't think it had made as deep an impression as it had, but I got back from my mission and really super, and we're talking like, this is like my deepest, darkest secret was that I was questioning. Um, and so it was kind of like in the back of my head questioning kind of ever since my mission. So, I mean, we're kind of going back 12 years or so, but it really became really acute. I would say about four, four years ago or so is when things really started getting really, it, it was just the, the, the silence and this and the, sort of secret doubts and all that stuff just started getting really crushing. So, Was there something in particular that brought it to the surface? <sighs> just accumulated. Well, you can, you can speak with a normal voice. <laughs> I was just, I was helping you. <laughs> no, say it. What, what you saying? I can use some help. Oh. No, I was just saying, like, with Prop 8. Oh, well, I, I think that's it. I think that, that's why this... Uh, the LGBT issue has been so central in our lives because it just sort of kept the timing of when things would crop up that would cause us together, but we didn't realize it at the time. But things would just sort of happen and make you sort of go, ah, oh, I just don't know if I agree with that. I just, I don't, I don't necessarily feel right about that, but not knowing how to express it. And when you kind of get yourself in one of those sensitive states of not, just, just not, not knowing how to feel about something, then every once in a while those little, things that you had 
kind of put in the back of your mind sort of creep up and you're like, wait, is this something I should explore deeper? Is this something that I should listen to? You start thinking it's Satan trying to deceive you, so then you want to push it down even more. But yeah, I would say one of the first major kind of uh, shake-up moments for us was Prop 8. And that's because Rachel's parents were actually living in California when it happened. And so we were kind of seeing firsthand what what, what was kind of happening on the, on the church front. And it was just stuff that we just, it just kind of blindsided me and Rachel because she had been raised fairly liberal. I wasn't. I was raised very conservative. Um, she was more liberal than, than I was at that point. But we were both kind of like, wow, this just, this doesn't necessarily feel like the organization that I thought I knew because they were just being so much more, um, direct in their dealings with, you know, politics and that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, Prop 8 was kind of one of those moments of, of, I would say shake up. What about you? Yeah. So, um, I think like Sage, uh, it's interesting, like looking back at my life and seeing all these moments where I had questions that, um, I don't think I ever really got satis- satisfactory answers to, but they were few and far enough between that it didn't really add up. Um, and so when Prop 8 popped up, like that, it was the same sort of thing where it's like I, I could kind of, I could disagree with the church and I could hold my own belief, but everything else was good around me. So it didn't really bother me enough at that moment, but it was definitely like, I would say like the, the, probably the first big moment. And then moving on from there, I'd say, like they said, like the last four years, I was just starting to feel a lot of cognitive dissonance. And kind of what I was feeling inside versus um, what I was seeing and learning at church. And it just just wasn't adding up. And it wasn't necessarily like I wasn't studying my church history at that time. It just was like I just felt just things just weren't feeling right at that time. And, and I didn't know how to put it into words and express it to Sage at that time. Um, so I kind of kept it to myself for a while. How did that impact both of you emotionally um, where you were holding this secret from each other? Um, and, I mean, did that? how did that impact your relationship and, and, and yourself? Do you guys think that you felt like the distance and didn't realize that that's what it was? Was there like this separation from you where you weren't really totally connecting because you were holding back? Um, I think it's, at the time, I don't, I don't know if I would have realized that we were so distant. Like, I think, you know, when you're, when you're in a marriage and you've been in it for a while, you, you just kind of go, start going through the motions a little bit and you don't really think about what you're doing. Um, until we actually did break down and start talking and realize, whoa, we haven't been talking, you know, for quite a while. And, and um, that moment of actually starting to talk and the walls falling down, and it just, like, became this really amazing moment. So I don't think at the time I, I realized it as much as um, after when we actually started to talk. I just did. Just seeing that. And, but that, that was me, so. Well, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mainly just your question, I mean, it was, it got so, it got really dark me for a while. I mean, I, I remember some really clear moments of like, like we'd be outside working in the yard or something and I, I think every married couple knows this moment. It's like, you have something you want to talk about. You just can't quite, you just, you just can't quite get it out of your mouth. You just, like, so it's right there on the tip of your tongue and you just can't say anything. And there was even moments where I would be like, just wanting to say something. And, and by the way, at this point, it really was just as simple as, we didn't necessarily disagree with any of the the doctrines or any fundamental differences in the church, it was just that fact that we just were feeling different and just feeling feelings that we weren't used to, kind of this cognitive dissonance thing. And it wasn't specifics, it was just sort of this general kind of feeling of change or just feeling different from, from kind of the crowd or the people around you. And so, yeah, there were so many times when I would be sitting there wanting so bad to say something, and she would even give me a and out, and she would look at me and say, hey, you, you look like you need to talk to me about something. It looks like you have something you want to say. And I would just like, 
I would totally was out at the last moment, you know. So, I mean, that went on for years where I just felt like I wanted, I was just going to, like, burst inside. I had to say something, but couldn't. Were you afraid? Yeah. What yeah, did you afraid. think would happen? Um, well, I mean, I always thought, like, the worst <laughs> mm -hmm. would happen. I mean, I guess it's one of those things that, I mean, Rachel's just a very sensitive person um in, in a really good way you know she's always just been so so sweet and and trusting and loving and stuff and i guess uh, i thought that i by admitting uh, admitting anything in terms of like fault or flaw and for me i i assumed that in her mind and i was wrong about this but i assumed that for her my assumption was that because she was she was very strong, believing, active member of the church that the worst thing I could ever do would be to admit that I had any sort of doubts about the church at all. Like, I almost felt like I could have admitted to her, like, <laughs> like an infidelity or something easier than I could have uh, admitted to, you know, dis disbelieving in any way, shape, or form the church. And so I think it was just not wanting to, to show that weakness to her and also just not not knowing if I... I was also really scared because I didn't want to put any of those doubts into her. I think that was the other thing, is that I, above all else, I didn't want her to go through the pain I was going through because someone, somewhere, something had planted that seed inside of me, and so I sure, certainly didn't want to be the thing to plant the seed inside of her. Too bad the seed was already planted, huh? <laughs> How, it, I guess this is revolting. You've had your spouse, um, had you found out that your spouse was still, still believed even though you doubted. Um, would you have been supportive of them continuing in the church? I mean, how, how, what do you think about that? That, I, I feel like in a lot of ways, like our relationship, we've, we've had it pretty easy <laughs> that, you know, that we've been on the same page for a lot. And, and it's, it, that is one of those sort of like, what if, like, I, I don't know what, what would we have done? And I think, I think I look at Sage and um, the person that he is, the moral character that he is, and I think I would would um, would respect and love that above all else. And I think that I mean that's at least what I hope. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, happens. yeah. I mean, I was I was committed. I mean, that was the thing. I was like, okay, if this is how I have to live the entire rest of my life. That might have been where some of the even depression came from. Was just that. I was like, no, I'm resigned to this. Like, I am going to power through this and accept how, you know, her, her, her belief and all that stuff. And I, I'll, I will play a, you know, sort of support, supporting role and just let that roll. And I mean, I don't know if I could have actually, I don't know if I could have sustained that because it, because it kind of got to a really bad place eventually. But I mean, I was definitely ready for that for that long haul because you know we both definitely did love each other and i think at the heart of it we did realize that i mean we loved each other and we loved the, the church but we were able to separate those two two things at least enough to be able to say like no i can still i mean i love this person right. not necessarily their religion right yeah. so now that you have left the religion do you feel like you are basically both still the same people on a moral level like you were Rachel, you were talking about Sage being, you know, a good moral man. Are there things that are different? I mean, I think, I think in a lot of ways we are different people than we were, you know, even a year ago. Um, but I think we always did have a moral core. And I think it, it, it's probably a really hard thing for active members, um, who haven't ever really gone through this struggle to understand, like, like how would leaving the church be like, uh, you know, being true and honest and moral and standing up for what you believe is right? Like, how that doesn't like add up. But that's how could you still be that kind of person if you left? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, sorry, no, it's okay. confusing. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's like I think that's the type of that we are and that's why we've made the choices that we've made um, and so I think in a lot of ways like we've stayed true to who, who we are at our core 
Right. I mean, I, I mean, I don't. I, mean, I think I think we're different in some ways from where we are at, but I think at our, I think at our core, I think we're just the same. I think it's like, for instance, um, I, I remember when I was when I was active and I was I was in the elders quorum presidency. I was the president and teaching lessons about. This was even like a couple of years ago. Like I taught a lesson about um, an atheist friend that I had, and how I had just been so impressed because we had had this conversation about uh, morality. Because I was coming from the position of, I don't, I don't think you can have morals unless you have sort of a, a an originator of these sorts of rules and laws that would sort of define what's good and bad. And, and this friend had helped me come to the conclusion that. Or it shared with me a conclusion that it was like, hey, you know, I actually think that it's more moral to, to act and do good in, in a situation that there's no guarantee or even really hope of a reward or a punishment either way. So I choose to do good. And if nobody sees me, like I don't believe that God necessarily sees me do it, but I still want to do it. And I think that's moral. And I was like, well, I can't really argue that <laughs> because I did live a whole lot of my life on just sort of this fear of reprimand or the hope of blessings, and so even even kind of before moving to this point, I think we're able to find, oh, this is what makes us good, this is what brings us happiness, and it's pretty much all the same stuff. It's, it's family, you know, it's doing good, it's service, it's other people, um, it's presence, in other words, like understanding that, you know, our kids are only young once, and yeah. but this part of our lives only exists once, and it almost doesn't matter your religious belief set. I, I don't think there's any religion that believes in a time machine that lets you go back and hold your kids as babies again, you know, so. Yeah. So do you feel like uh, the people who associated with you at church and and maybe families, loved ones who knew you as active LDS members, do they see you the same? Do you think that they have an understanding of what you just described, of being moral? Even though you're not religious, what what kind of problems or feelings have arisen from having their sort of attitude or or the way that they see it be possibly different? Yeah, we have a we have sort of a spectrum, and so I think it's probably more valuable to talk about those that have a have a hard time with it. I think I think so for me. <laughs> I just know I sympathize so much with with the active believing point of view because it just wasn't even that long ago. Even when I was doubting, I mean, the thing that would go through my head was almost like these little inner dialogues where me as the believing member part of me would sort of interact with the unbelieving part of me. And I knew how I thought about other people that went inactive, at the very least, like let alone people who would, say, be excommunicated or resign. That was the worst. And so... I just know I, uh, or I can, I can sympathize because I've been there and felt that of knowing that, okay, it almost doesn't matter. This is what I've come to accept is that any, anything we do, um, for, for some people now always kind of has an asterisk by it, you know, because that's how I felt at one point. Like, yeah, somebody out here, they might be, you know, showing acts of charity or they might be going to worship services, but, you know, they had that, they had that truth, they had this thing, so they're sort of accepting second best or whatever, and so, and I think that acceptance has actually made it easier where I don't actually feel, I don't feel bitter about that, and I don't feel, um, judged necessarily. I do understand that from a certain, per, certain perspective, you know, we are, um, you know, cho- choosing a, a, a lesser path in, in their eyes, and that's, and it's hard. It still kind of like kind of hurts your pride center a little bit. But luckily, I think people have tried. I mean, for people have tried to be um, cool about it and accepting. We've had enough of those positive experiences. And and even when the most negative experience you get is somebody trying to, on a, honestly, out of real love and concern, call you to repentance or or whatever, it's still like, hey, this person actually did something that's really brave. It's really hard to open your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And talk to somebody. And I think that's helped. I think that's actually calm people down because our response is never to like fight back it's always like thank you <laughs> like I really appreciate you saying that I know that was hard to do thank you we hug a lot we do a lot of hugging 
<laughs> that disarms people a little bit, but no, I understand that we're, we're looked at differently now. There's no way around that. That's the truth. How old are your kids? Um, we have an eight-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. So how is this? How has this impacted their lives? Um, you know, this year was the year that our daughter would have been baptized, and um, you know, up and up until the very last minute, basically, we we were planning on that happening. Yeah, it was weeks away. It was literally weeks away when we decided to stop going. Um, but we, and we, we ultimately, you know, we wanted it to be her sort of decision. And so we left it up to her. We went and talked to her about it. And, um, you know, we asked her if she wanted to be baptized and she said yes. And then we said, well, why, why do you get baptized? And, People have probably heard this story when Sage shared it, but um, what she told us is she needed to be baptized because she was dirty. Mm -hmm. And that was really heartbreaking for us. And so we talked to her about it and we said, you don't, you don't have to be baptized for that reason. You know, you're, you're perfect as you are. You're a good kid. You know, you haven't done anything wrong yet. And, um, so we talked, we talked, talked about it and we said, you know, I don't think that this is the time, and and she, it, you could tell that she was a little bit relieved with that, and and you know she had been around us. She's a smart kid, kind of seeing. You know, we've tried not to hide our conversations from our kids, and and tried to pull them into to these conversations that we've had, and, and she's pretty smart and understands what's going on, and and uh, I think it's it's been pretty good for them. I mean, I think one of the reasons we decided, because we kind of saw the writing on the wall, that longevity in the, in the church was not going to happen for us. We, we figured it's probably better to pull out sooner than later mm -hmm. um, because of these reasons. And Sage can maybe speak more to this because of sort of his experience with his own dad growing up. Um, yeah, I mean, because that's it's always the ultimate question. I mean, when you have kids in the mix, it complicates things, as I'm sure you guys can understand. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, to a degree, just that it, it scared me so much. I mean, that was one of the reasons I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I've committed to this path, which was the path of, of staying in the church and just keeping my head down. Uh, basically, because of both Rachel and the kids, it was like, no, these guys are, these are, they're in it, <laughs> mm -hmm. and there's, there's no turning back from this, and this is my choice, and this is what I'm going to do. And so, um, and, and being raised in the church, both of us, we didn't know any different. Um, so everything that I saw as being, like, I, I attributed all the good things in my life, all the good uh, events and the stuff that let me kind of be a good person, I attribute all of it to, to the church. And so looking at a life without it at first was like super scary, but then all we kind of knew was like, okay, one step at a time, what we're going to do is just keep, we just have to be extra present. We're like, okay, now we don't have this sort of surrogate parent, which is what the church you know, can be. So we have to sort of double up. And what, what Rachel was uh, alluding to is that, you know, I, um, I grew up with just just my mom. My parents divorced when I was about 13, and it was really ugly. And kind of the the primary factor that kept me from communicating with my dad was that he left he left the church at that time. But that made me dig in my heels. That made me say, "Whoa, I'm going to be extra good. I'm going to be extra righteous." Um, but my relationship with him was was super tainted because I found myself pitying him and never really. I didn't have any respect for him, and, uh, you know, I just, and, and even though I would sort of smile or I, I would, you know, kind of go through the motions, always in the back of my head was just, okay, this guy's made a bunch of mistakes. I need to sort of be extra good to show him. My whole goal was to sort of, you know, show him the light. And it was realizing that that was a moment when we were, right here on the precipice and on the edge when it was like, oh no, like, <laughs> I know that the church is and can be a good place for 
for kids, but also having served in the young men's and being a kid myself and growing up, I recognize that it also does have the potential to cause to cause them confusion and to cause them, um, I don't know, sometimes it can become almost an us versus the parent sort of thing uh, when, and it's all, it's all very subtle, it's never overt, but it's just like, you know, you know, pray for your parents or here are ways that you can support them or here's a way you can help. Right, with their names on the prayer roll or whatever. With their names on the prayer roll, yeah, that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, so when we saw, okay, we're not really sure what the path is to raising <laughs> good kids outside of the church, but we just want them to, we don't want them to be conflicted and, and we're going to give it a shot because we, we want them, we want to do this as a family. We want to be unified. And so what we just started doing was like, okay, we're going to make sure that where they would have learned, like where were those moments? Like, so you go to church once a week. So let's make sure, and at family home evening. So let's make sure there's at least two times a week there's some time when we actually have like a serious discussion or we get kids together. And let's be extra diligent about, uh, you know, asking them questions and encouraging them to ask questions of us. And so Rachel will very often, she'd go down with, with maybe our daughter, Yes, her name is Maybe. I don't know if you've mentioned that yet. <laughs> and was, isn't your other one like Walker, Texas Ranger or something like that? <laughs> the Ricky Bobby Bauer. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's Bowie. Bowie, okay. Either the knife or the singer, but it was really the singer. But, <laughs> but yeah, Rachel, she would go down with Maybe and she'd just like lay with her in bed and they'd just talk. And this like didn't happen beforehand. And so kind of the coolest thing has happened. I mean, ever since, I mean, the question originally, was how this impacted our kids, and um, so far, and it hasn't been that that long, but so far, it's, it's really brought us closer. I mean, it's just their openness now. I mean, they're they're asking a bunch of. I mean, they're just asking tons of questions, not even necessarily about um, church or faith stuff. Although there's there's that too, which we try to be as open as we can with them. But uh, yeah, there's just the communication, and, and they're young too. So I mean, luckily there hasn't been too many crazy curveballs coming from the eight or the four year old and we know they're coming. Right. No. We, sort of, we run like fire drills, like, okay, what's gonna happen when she asks about <laughs> sex, right? Or whatever. So you guys uh, live in Utah, correct? Correct. Salt are Lake. You, Salt Lake. So is that uh, are you in a heavy, a densely LDS area or is it more diverse? Uh, it's one of those places about half and half. Okay. So it's not like Utah County or anything, but I mean it's a pretty healthy population. So so they this sounds horrible, but they have opportunities for finding friends who not are, aren't necessarily conditionally being friends to them. Um, is, that... is there an us them happening with yeah. you and your kids <laughs> in your community? Hmm? No, you know, we we live in a really great neighborhood. I'm really involved in our school, and um, I was. A little bit worried about that happening, um, especially some of those really hardcore families, and they've been some of the families that have reached out the most to us and our kids to make sure that they know that they were still friends. Um, and okay. so it's been really positive. And we've also we also have a lot of friends that were already out of the church or not ever members of the church, and so we already kind of had that that mixture. And so. Fortunately, where we're at, like, we haven't had that experience where somebody has said, oh, we, you know, kind of brushing us off politely. Or, or telling maybe she can't sleep over. No, we've been so lucky. Yeah. I mean, we just feel so, we've had such a positive experience with the members in our area, but, like, no complaints. Oh, yeah, wow. they've been, we actually went to our ward Christmas party this weekend. and Which was a day after we actually got our letter. <laughs> Officially make, making it official that we were no longer members, but we went and it was great. Every, I mean, just like we expected. I mean, everyone was just really open and friendly and, um, of course it's a, it's a little awkward, but not nearly as awkward as it could have been. So here's my complaint about work Christmas parties. No <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of, seeing both sides now, you're like, oh man, if only these people knew how much fun they could be having. Yeah. <laughs> Now Naomi thinks um, she she has fun even without it. Her family, she got mistaken for being drunk all the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time in, high, yeah. in college. You get high off of life. Yeah, I, I'm just pretty like that. <laughs> oh, I understand that. So 
what have you guys indulged in any sins since uh Did you go out and watch every R rated movie and get well, your coffee like fifty million times a day. <laughs> That's right. Just watch all the die hard yep. every drug. <laughs> Giant mug of coffee. <laughs> well we I mean we we I mean I don't know. I, I, I always assume that every member harbors like a secret fascination with coffee just from how often I'd see them linger in like the coffee aisle at the grocery store. But <laughs> we're looking at the hot cocoa, okay? That's right, yeah. Just <laughs> with their noses around the corner. Sniffing away. Um yeah, well our thing was that we were gonna take it pretty slow. As we moved out. I mean we we were pretty honest and open and saying like, you know, I mean it's definitely we're not necessarily afraid of of trying things like alcohol or coffee or that kind of thing. So we've we've tried and we've kind of worked our way slowly through through stuff, really more sort of taste testing things and just sort of getting comfortable. But we've we've been super careful to not uh I mean like we've never been drunk and we've never really done anything more than try like a drink here here or there. We are we did have a coffee maker that I knocked off of the table and it blew up into a million pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a sign. Right another there. sign. <laughs> went ahead and bought another one. So, so the, just, now here's the. I mentioned this in the email, but has this impacted your intimate life too, or has it been pretty status quo? We have some, we have some cool stories about that. Oh, great! Oh, we do. Let me pull out my notebook. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Can we? up to the explicit rating on this podcast all of a sudden. <laughs> there will be diagrams, people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just uh, we won't get explicit or anything, but we part of I should, I should back up, so it was about how long ago when finally did open up to one another about about doubting. Probably about three or four years ago. And this is like a really raw moment. I mean, this is a moment, I mean, we were and we've shared this on our website, so it's not it's not too too secret. But we were we were in the shower, and it was like it was just a typical thing. It wasn't a, a romantic thing. We were just sort of you know in, just doing their daily thing, and 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 Rachel just uh, kind of out of the blue, it totally took me by surprise. She just broke down, just crying. And this was just the culmination of like years of just not being able to talk, and again having these little doubts, and not really anything specific. Even it was just I feel so alone, and I feel so different, and I feel so. I don't know, just, it really is amazing how lonely you can feel two feet away from somebody you love and you just can't talk to you. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the loneliest feeling in the whole world. And so, I mean, having that moment, suddenly, we just, we, we really did make a commitment to one another that we were just not going to keep any more secrets and we weren't going to, and we were just going to talk about everything. And that led to some painful discussions. I mean, that led to some stuff that definitely like pushed Push some buttons and some, and some boundaries, but it also allowed us to talk, you know, about things like sex and intimacy, which had always been fine. I mean, we had, we had a good, uh, romantic life, but, you know, we also didn't talk about it very much. We certainly didn't get into the nitty gritty about, you know, our past or our history and, and, you know, things like, had we ever done this sort of thing before? And that led to, 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 to really, open and important conversations and it's just I guess not really hearing anything about sex and growing up the thing you also don't really hear is like how important being like mentally intimate is. Mm -hmm. So that opened up a lot. I mean in terms of new new things to try, it's not necessarily new as much as it is uh better and deeper. You do you feel like do you mean like on an emotional level mostly? Yeah. Yes. That might have sounded bad. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Well, no, I wanted to clarify because. <laughs> just, just, just for the drinking game, I, I don't know if you've heard our prior podcast. Hey, they did not drop. They did not. Okay. So we, a, anytime Shh, Naomi doesn't count. cries, um, yes, one, take two, a drink. So Naomi. No, nope, no drinks, people. Her eyes were well, welling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, at an emotional level, in a, in a really incredible way. And I don't know if you want to share a moment, your moment when another, she's looking at me like maybe she doesn't want to. 
I'm not sure which moment. No, um, <laughs> There's so just, many moments. I just remember a moment that we, so, so Rachel was able to share with me something, another thing, so this is like now a year after, so our intimate life did get better after we started being more open and communicative, and then it got even better um, when the sort of final, I think, sort of wall dropped, because there had always been a little bit of a distance, and you were able to sort of share with me something that you had kept bottled up for a really long time. Do you want to share any details about that? <laughs> totally putting me on the spot now. You don't have to. <laughs> so, I mean, um, I basically, um, like, I, I was not a virgin when I got married. Okay. And I was so terrified to tell him that. So now you guys can have drinks because I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a big um, one, guys. And so I think finally when we were able to start communicating about everything, I felt like that was something I needed to, to communicate with him. Um, and so is that what you wanted me to share? Yeah, yeah. Well, just because at that moment it was just like we really – it just became clear that this commitment to one that, like, I, I don't think I ever would have handled news like that well, which is like, I just I feel embarrassed even saying that, but you know, I just, I don't think if we had started down this path of true communication and being really open about all kinds of stuff, would I have been able to necessarily handle that, and I think I handled it pretty good. Yeah. And, it, and in <laughs> fact, I think, I don't know, just like, it, it's, it's suddenly like, oh, we're, we are in this thing together, and our warts, I don't want to call that a, that a wart, but, the things that you thought were going to cause pain have actually caused growth for us. So it was just like this really beautiful moment that I just, I, I respected her so much for being willing to admit something that's frankly so taboo. I mean, we were still in, I mean, it's just still a moment where, you know, I mean, church still ranked pretty, pretty highly in our, in our lives. And so for her, the, for me, the courage of her to, to, to admit and talk so openly about that was, was huge. And, and then things started falling into place. Suddenly it felt like we could now start start fixing some of the little weird things that were sort of wrong or some of the things that uh, you know could could use a little housekeeping, if you will. And uh yeah, it was just a really, really powerful moment. So I don't know, we're just we're just advocates for communication, I mean, because we've seen it both ways and life is so so much better with communication. It's hard, but it's better. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Well, and I was gonna say too, you said, you know, there's so much growth. But it does come after the pain. <laughs> Don't think that it's painless, people. I know. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard. I'm sure that was really hard for you, Rachel, to tell him that. And yet, I can feel the relief from you now that it's out there and he has still loved and accepted you. I would see why you'd be closer after that. Um, and the fact that he speaks so highly of the way that you opened up to him. It shows another level of intimacy. Yeah. Well, and I think it, um, sort of come to these sort of thoughts about, about faith and the things that we believe in and the people we believe in. And w one of the things that I used to think in, in my faith, both in people and in even like the church was that I believe in this person really strongly, but I don't want to, I don't want to test them. I don't want to like, I don't want to poke at it. I yeah. think because inherently I always felt like it might actually break sort of subconscious, and I think maybe that comes from, as a kid, sort of having, you know, sort of my dad and with other relationships, where it turned out to not be what I thought it was, and so I would have this, I almost call it, um, it's like a brittle faith, it was like it was so strong, it was like concrete or glass, like if you push it on it in one direction, it would be so strong, but I was so afraid if you pushed on it just the wrong way, that it, it would shatter, or even like the way I would pray, like I'd almost pray to God, like, like, you want one of those genies that would sort of grant you your wish, but in a really weird way. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the wrong way, you know? Because I would hear stories. I'd hear somebody say, like, oh, I just, I wanted, you know, I prayed for, like, more time with my kids. And so then one of their kids gets hit by a car, and so now they're bedridden. And you're like, oh, like, I guess God <laughs> granted your wish. <laughs> that, seems like, that seems like a tangent, but just, like, this idea that, for me, I loved her, and I trusted her. At least I thought I did. 
and I had faith in her, at least I thought I did, but I was so afraid to actually put that to the test, which now I look back on it and tells me that I didn't really have faith. Um, I was just afraid. And now that like I found that, all right, if I do have faith in a person or in somebody, I need to actually put that into action. I actually need to sort of, I don't want to say test it as in like I devise these games, sort of <laughs> test her, her love, but I just, I, I need, if I really have faith and I believe in the strength of something, I believe in the value or virtue of something, then I shouldn't be afraid. I shouldn't be afraid to, um, to sort of, sort of live that. And so I think that's what we found is that, okay, now we know that we have real trust in one another. It's not untested trust. It's the trust of, We've shared some really deep things. We've been through a lot of stuff and still still love each other. So Survive the... I, I mean, th- this is something that our... We our, talked about that just yeah, this past session. Yeah, our also. therapist talks with us a lot. Leaning on each other and not being afraid that we're going to break the other person, like you said, or that it will be too much for them. You know, you, you ask... It's funny, I want to help my spouse. I want to help Neil all the time if he's going through something hard. But if I'm having a really hard time, I don't always go to lean on him because I'm afraid it will be too much for him because I see the hard time he's going through. And um, so in that way, I can I can relate too. It, it's almost like uh, the, the stereotypical LDS person who wants to serve and is willing to go out of their way to serve others but won't accept and, and, and you know what that's not just LDS it's I think it's, it's humans people. in general mm-hmm. um, they don't we don't like to accept service and I think you know we as spouses try and emotionally serve each other <clears throat> and don't always and and don't want to give that trust to our don't spouse yeah <laughs> yeah and yet that's what makes the relationship better, like you said. Yeah. I think it is, and I, I don't, I mean, I know that other people do this too, but I think there is something sort of culturally, fundamentally sort of Mormon about, look, you, you, you should be the one giving charity, like you really should always, like somebody asks you if there's anything they can do for you, you're supposed to say no. <laughs> you're supposed to say we're fine, you know, and I think that just comes from a place of, you know, you don't want to, I think you don't want to be seen and so it's not even necessarily being seen as weak, but I think it is that you're supposed to be giving, and if you're and if you're re- receiving, then then something's wrong. And so you want to kind of be the strong one. You want to be pushing out there. But I think that's a great analogy: is that you are you don't necessarily introspect and say, "Man, I I I like it when I serve. So why shouldn't I give other people the opportunity to do so?" Right. I'm having this picture of uh, you know the emperor's new gro- new groove when. They have their backs to each other and they're both leaning on each other and pushing in order to climb up the the cliff. cliff. And I'm thinking, like, that's what I'm seeing. Like, well, duh, unless you lean on each other, you can't get anywhere. That's the way that you do it is by allowing each other to hold each other up. I think we could easily do the rest of this podcast in Disney metaphor. (laughs) Yeah, we could. We could. Let's just do that. But you know, let me ask you both, um, individually have have you ever been afraid that you are going to break? Like, that maybe you can't bring something up, or you can't lean on them, or or you can't change the status quo in the situation because you might not survive it? Yes. Go for it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I just, uh, I've talked so much, I was hoping to feel that little smack. <laughs> well, Sage, your voice is pleasant, so... Oh, thank you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, so, Naomi, yes. And that's, um, let me see how to, how to explain it. So, so part of what's super hard about not having questions of your faith, and this is something I've talked about with, with other people who were not raised in our church, and I, and I know that our church is not alone in this thing, but the others that I've talked to are, are from Christian, sort of general Christian denominations. Um, I can just tell it's just it's fundamentally different. Where when I talk about um, having questions or doubting or all that, all that stuff, like it's it's not just a matter of life or, or death; it's a matter of afterlife. 
or death, and we don't have any uh, necessarily tools given to us to deal with that. And so, and so, when you're a, a person like me, that like I've just been taught my whole life, like, look, you can't even. I mean, you go to church, like you're supposed to bear your testimony, like you're supposed to say, "I know the church is true." Like I've never once heard somebody say, "I think it's true," <laughs> or "I don't think it's true," let alone that. Or uh, like I was told to never both elder, my eldest quorum presidency and when I was in young men's presidency, uh, we were specifically told that you should never talk about your sins, you should never talk about past transgressions. Um, that was a big thing on the mission, too. Yeah, the same, yeah, exactly. And I think it, I don't know, because I guess we're going to put ideas into people's heads or something. Or what I actually was told was that it's because they'll see that, oh, they can sin and they can be okay like you will, so it encourage them to sin because if they can turn out okay, then they don't want them to do that. Anyway, point was that I wasn't even given the tools, I wasn't even given a dialogue for for how to admit anything, any form of weakness. And so when I felt my testimony on the verge of breaking, um, and I felt like I couldn't why I couldn't communicate with her and why I couldn't help I couldn't give her this pain because I didn't know I didn't know what was behind the dam. I didn't know how much was going to come flooding out and flooding away. Like I, I honestly at a certain point did not know if I was a good person without the church. I didn't know uh, <laughs> what else there was. I didn't know if, you know, I like I actually did think at a certain point that my love for Rachel or for my kids and all this stuff was dependent on, on the church. And so that for me is why I was like so terrified of all of this is because I didn't know what was on the other side, and there was nobody I could, I mean, there were actually were a lot of people around, but you didn't think so, that I could shine a flashlight on and say, like, what does life look like without this, or how is it even possible, like, a podcast like yours, what I think is so valuable is, I had seen in my life that when my parents broke up, it was like an atomic bomb went off, like, it was really ugly. That was the only thing I had seen. I'd either seen, like, these nuclear families, like, my friends all had, like, really strong mother-father families. And here I had a sort of a quote unquote broken one. And so that for me was the fear was this unknown that was like, what, what waters are going to flood out of this if the dam breaks? And so that was why I couldn't tell because I didn't know what the repercussions were going to be because I just saw this domino effect of like, oh, I could lose my faith. I could lose my family. I could lose my wife. I could lose my job. I could lose, I don't even know why I thought I'd lose my job. It doesn't have anything to do with the church. <laughs> why not? It's possible in there. So that for me was when it was at the darkest, and this is before we had opened up and started talking, but this was when I was really like, I cannot tell her. And I felt bad because I didn't want to be, be pushes, but I also was just like, this is, I have to do this. I have to tamp this down. I have to be silent because I could be committing spiritual murder if I was to plant something in her head, you know, or if I was to sort of knock these dominoes down and that impacted my kids or, or my wife or my family. Do, do and then that stuff. sin is on your head. Yeah. <laughs> like, like how, uh, how deep did the depression go? Were you, were either of you to the point where you were suicidal or? No, luck, luckily no. And I don't want to make, I don't, I don't want to joke at all about that. No, I, and I don't intend it to be a joke. I, I mean, I, I think it's oh. a real issue. Yeah, I don't. And I wasn't implying that you were joking. I was going to make a joke, and then I mentally told myself, "Don't <laughs> control <don't."> yourself." Because, <laughs> because thank, thank goodness, like definitely, um, I had not gotten to that point. But, but my heart just goes out to anybody that that has. It, it just got it got to the point where it was like I didn't know what depression was. I don't think I've ever been like what would be considered clinically depressed. So I don't even want to. I, I almost feel bad that, that I would have lumped myself into that, but I mean, it was at the point where it was like, okay, I didn't, like, I didn't want to get up, and, like, you know, you'd wake up and you're like, uh, another, another day where I just, I don't know anything anymore in my life. I don't even know what it means, and I can't talk to her right over here. Well, at that point in your life, he, he had had this experience, a few experiences that, left him, you know, feeling that there was no God, that there was nothing after this life. And so he was absolutely terrified of dying, or one of us dying. Yeah. And so he was at this point where 
you know, when he'd wake up in the morning, he was hoping that that whole experience, everything that he'd been feeling was just a dream. Oh, yeah, I was, I was hoping my life was a dream. I was actually hoping that it all was a dream because it was so terrifying to live in a world that where I had lost my faith. And I had lost it. I mean, I really did. I mean, I'm, I don't believe in God to this, to this day, so I am an atheist and I'm okay saying that I've gotten to that point. But, but when you're doing that silently and secretly, you can't talk about it at all. Like now you have existential dread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beaten down on you and that's super hard. Yeah. What about you, Rachel? Um, you know, I, I, you know, over the years I try to figure out what, who am I? What kind of person am I? And, and I've definitely had moments in my life triggered by, um, experiences that where I had probably heavier depression. It, it definitely runs in my family. Um, I tend to actually have a, a little more anxiety <laughs> than depression. So I just get, I get very anxious and just stressed out and concerned about things. Um, and, and, I, and it goes through cycles and I kind of understand my cycle and, and, um, and so like this definitely was like working in it. And I actually like after, after we came out to one another, I had a bit of a renaissance period for a year or two where I was really excited about um, church and learning about church and just learning about the history and stuff and not necessarily like connecting all these things I was learning to, you know, what does it all mean, but it was just kind of fun to learn, <laughs> learn about and um, just made going to church more exciting that I could add something interesting to the conversation. When you say learn, do you mean like history or doctrine or both? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had, I had a pretty good um, seminary teacher that I had learned stuff about Joseph Smith and polygamy and all that stuff, you know, so it's like I, I kind of knew those sorts of things and being married to, to Sage, like, you know, he, he, you know, maybe shared stuff here and there that, you know, over the years, we kind of talked about just sort of just fun, interesting things. But, um, but yeah, just I I got really into like like studying the polygamy. I got really into I don't know if you've heard the podcast um, Mormon Sunday School. No. With Jared Anderson, it's really good because he he comes he he talks about things and he actually I think that really helped me get through this whole crisis thing um, pretty successfully because... So ju I just want to just level set for the podcast that takes the, the Sunday school lesson yeah. for the next week and it gets like a panel of people, uh, all, all kind of believing people uh, together to really just sort of dive into it and explore like sort of doctrinally, scripturally, all this kind of stuff. Like what more can we... It's like what, three hours long sometimes? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh wow, so it's like a, it's a gospel doctrine lesson on steroids. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah. he'll he'll get. I mean, he is um, is he's working on a PhD in theology. You know, he under you know he's studying ancient Hebrew and all that stuff. So, so anyway, so I I was getting into his his podcast, and he would ask these sort of questions, where it'd be like, let's just go down the rabbit hole a little bit, and it'd be like, what if you know, like, did, does the book of Abraham have to have been real, you know, for it to be this? And just making me think about these questions, you know, in a, in a safe way. Mm -hmm. I was able to really, like, you know, because I see a lot of people that kind of go through this on their own. Like, they come out and they're just like, ah, like, they've lost everything with it. And I was able to kind of, like, do it in this safe way, like thinking these things sort of, you know, hy hypothetically, what if this was the case? And can we actually still learn something from it? So I was like going through all this, and I think like a really positive, exciting way instead of this like breaking me sort of way. Yeah, it's, it's almost like when you admitted to me that you had doubts, I mean, my response was like, me, me too. And that's a, 
I think that's okay. <laughs> right. Like, I think lots of people do, and I think that gave you permission to, like, oh. Yeah, and, and that I really can actually like now it. start to tackle them head on, and that's kind of like what I had done, too, on my mission, where it's like, anything that gave me doubts because I was convinced that the truth was true, I was like, well, I can push through this by actually studying more, you know, or whatever. So it's almost this, like, instead of shying away from the stuff that might cause doubts, it's like, let's just dig in. So, that's what you did, and you actually got really excited about this. Yeah, so I was having that moment of being able to get through it in in in, in a positive sort of way. So yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. Now, I just okay. Oh, you got before to... we move on. I just wanted to say one of the things I was really excited about uh, interviewing you guys because I know your situation isn't the same as ours, and you both left. Um, I'm really, I was really excited to hear some of the struggles and feelings and things that you went through so that I can empathize more with Neil on what he's gone through. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've really enjoyed that hearing kind of the thought process and how you've seen things. Um, and I think it will help me immensely. But I also found very interesting, Sage, when you were talking about being afraid of you know, the, the floods just coming out if the dam breaks uh, of yourself, not knowing what that means and being afraid to confront it, um, made me think of myself too. Like I know that Neil has talked about that and, and I've heard a little bit about your situation, but I know that when I had a feeling that things were going on and I knew you were questioning, I knew that you were doubting, I purposely avoided it. I purposely tried to not find out. I wanted to not ask those questions. I didn't want to be put in a situation where you might actually talk about it because I didn't know what would happen. I thought I would break. Yeah. yeah. I thought I would. I didn't know what would happen. My world would fall apart and I would break. And I didn't know what all that entailed, but it scared the crap out of me. Has your world fallen apart? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Worlds fall apart. Yeah. Yep. The Brigham mm -hmm. Young said that this world is made up of the fallen pieces of other worlds. So. And guess <laughs> what? I'm still standing. So. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your website. And I mean, I, we don't need to get into bashing on the church because. I don't, that, that's not the point, but I want to talk a little bit about your website and your activism, uh, and, and why you do what you do. So with that broad question, can you talk, give us some information? Sure. Um, I think something that, that most everybody recognizes, sometimes I think people that People get angry on either side, maybe forget this, but we've certainly haven't, is that the church has been and always will be two parts, is the people and it's the church, you know. Um, and, and our activism has almost always been focused on the, the people, you know, and, and so for us, um, I mean, we don't have anybody in our family, neither of us, is gay. We don't think our kids are gay. Although, again, our, our son loves wearing dresses and shoes and stuff like that, but he's got a big sister, so I don't know. But there's nobody, like, immediately in our family that, that you know, that that's what people ask, ask us a lot because clearly a lot of our decisions and a lot of what we've done um, has sort of had this through line of LGBT activism. Mm -hmm. Um. And that came from a couple of key experiences that I can just sum up as saying, uh, when you, when you know somebody and you see somebody that uh, defies your expectations, so, so meeting people, members, like active members who, who were gay and who, and just seeing the pain that that caused them, um, and we're talking people who, I remember one guy just to sort of share some new, new stories because our website has a couple of stories that if you want to go read after this, they can. But uh, another What's your one website? was 
So it's called wileyleft.info. Okay. Um, and the purpose of that was to sort of just get our story down so that, you know, family and friends and forever this would be sort of raw or interested but just weren't ready for it yet. It's just kind of there there for people to go to. And we tried writing it in a way, and we hope we get this that's trying to be, you know, keep keep those people in mind, and it's trying to be fair, and it's trying to just speak honestly without getting into, I don't think it really bashes the church. I think it's, I don't know, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to tell these days maybe about what, what would or would not be considered taking it too far for somebody. But anyway, basically we had, I had an experience, this is just one of many, that there was a guy at my work who was who was gay? Who was active? Who was not in a relationship? He was not acting on uh, you know, his his urges or anything like that. But for him, he was just so crushed and so sad. And the thing that he told me was, he's like, "All I want, I want one thing. It's like I just want to hear once from the pulpit the leadership talk to me and not about me." And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I would just like to hear once somebody say to my dear gay brothers and sisters, fill in the blank, we love you, or we understand you, or we're thinking about you. And he's like, I hear them bring up the issue, and I hear them talk about, well, if you have family or friends are dealing with this or, or whatever, but he always felt like he was being talked around and not directly to, and his issue was being talked about way more than he as a person was being talked about. It was just one of those kind of like aha moments where I was like, wow, like that's, that's not right. I mean, that's, you can fix that. That's easy. If you feel like you haven't been addressed. And so I immediately, it was like that Sunday, I like went to like elders quorum, like taught a lesson. I was like, hey, anybody out there, if you're feeling lonely or you're feeling doubting, and of course you make these lists, if you're, you know, whatever, struggling, if you're, if you're gay, if you're, uh, of a different faith, or if you have family members that are going through this, like, we still love you, like, we, we want you here, like, this is where you should be. And so my sort of activism, although on the face of it, the obvious thing is sort of the LGBT community, but for us it was just inclusion. Mm -hmm. This is what Rachel was doing, you know, she would stand up and bear her testimony, these beautiful, uh, raw testimonies, just saying, we just need to love, like, please, can we just show love? Um, and that felt like a fight that didn't feel like it was in conflict with the church, just kind of felt like we were in conflict with sort of ignorance mm -hmm. and maybe people who just didn't, just didn't know any better because you know how it is. I mean, you've got people that all kind of think everyone around them feels the same way or is going through the same thing as, as them. And, and that's what I hated. Like I just, I, I just would cringe when I would hear people members who I knew were good people say just like kind of really it, sort of ignorant things or hurtful things. I mean, it, it's real hard for me to like hear an active member like use a slur or something that would be used kind of directed towards, towards gay people. And I would hear that and I just think, ah, oh, you just don't, you just don't know, you just don't understand. And this is something I can help fix. Um, and it starts with just kind of saying, I'm not okay with that. That's kind of where it started, was saying, I'm not okay with that. Um, and then, I think that sort of took the fear out of, because we were afraid. I mean, we were afraid to talk or whatever, to even just <laughs> get to know. I mean, we were afraid to get to know somebody outside of our ward. I mean, we live on a ward boundary. We don't even know the people across the street from us, because they're in a different ward. <laughs> mm -hmm. So going out of our way to like meet or interact with, um, you know, the one of the homosexual guys on our street or somebody at my work or something like that. I mean, once we kind of got over that sort of fear, we're just like, well, let's just talk to these people and let's see. And suddenly they stopped becoming these people and they started becoming people. And I was like, oh, you're, <laughs> I, I can't even believe that I thought this way. You guys are just the same as us. Like, I don't have to say, you know, gay people are just like us. They're just like us. They happen to be gay. And so that's kind of where our activism that's where activism started, and that's where uh, I think it remains. And so, yes, yeah, so we've come to we've come to a position where we don't believe in the believe in the church, and definitely the positions that um, that the church and, and some of the people have 
have sort of made or will publicly sort of declare, gave us sort of the space to explore more of what we actually believe fundamentally about it, which it did sort of help grease the wheels, if you will, towards us. Right. Leaving. But, but again, it's really, and that, to, to this day, I still believe that, you know, there's so much good that can be done inside the church among the people because that makes all the difference. And we've seen firsthand that when active members go out of their way to, to show you love, you feel love, you know? Right. And that, that dissonance of like, because we don't feel convinced, or, or um, what should I say this? We're not being talked into going back and they're not even necessarily trying, but we feel love. Yeah. We feel maybe in love some sort, sort of from a distance. <laughs> if anything you want to like add to that or that was a lot for me. Sorry. <laughs> I'll just say it starts with it's basically it's the people and we we believe that the people have the most potential to do good. It doesn't matter, it will never matter as much what the, the church does or says as what the people do and say. Amen, brother. Say <laughs> it's true religion, brother. Yeah, preach. <laughs> wow. Well, we we're out of time, man. <laughs> we've been talking forever. I could, we could keep going. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> we love talking to you guys. It's great. Yeah, yeah, I I feel bad like ending it right when we're talking about your. <laughs> the... Yes, if you're interested, go check it out. Obviously, they're awesome. Um, if you're more like me, just trying to stay out of it because it is one of those things. <laughs> you know, what, do your thing. Think, what? Naomi, can I can I say something? Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I think one of the things for me that I was feeling that like I think that you're feeling that discomfort of these of these issues, mm -hmm. and we just want to like hide from them. And not and just not yeah. hide. It's just not just, hide, but like, it's, I would rather just not get in the middle of that. Yeah, it's yeah. like I just don't <laughs> want to deal with it. It's not my issue. You know, I have enough going on on my own plate. You know, like I don't need to add something else. But I, one of the things that for me that got me into the activism and stuff was that those moments, like when I'd be um, listening to the news, and and this happened with. Um, like when the ordained women like came on on the scene and you know there's a big news report and I just got that pit in my stomach and I just was like Ugh. like I just don't want to feel uncomfortable but I started sort of forcing myself to um, to look into these things that that may beforehand would have made me uncomfortable and then seeing the people well, you, start, you, started looking, like, you started looking for the stories, the like story, the people behind it. Yeah, the story of these people, and that that really made all the difference for me. And 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 even like with the LGBT thing, like I I started listening even before I started listening to Mormon stories. I listened to gay Mormon stories, yeah. and that seriously that changes your heart. Well, I'll tell and, you where I'm at. I'm kind of where you guys were, like just. I'm with the people. Yeah. If, if I, I take each person as a person and as their own whole and the people who are in my life, I want to get to know them. I want to accept them. I want to love them. I want to be their advocate, whether they're gay, whether they're drinking or non-drinking, whether they're, you know, wherever they're at, mm -hmm. that's where I'm interested simply because of how crazy my life is right now. I can't oh, yeah, sure. I sure. can't find the time or energy to spend on actually being <laughs> an activist. <laughs> but I invite anyone into my life and whoever you are, let me love you and let me think that you're awesome because I do I have a lot of those same feelings that you guys are describing. And I I don't think that they go against the doctrine of the church at this point so and you're doing something that it, i think it's hard for for a lot of members to do which is to even in this podcast you know what i can really hear is is, is someone that's willing to accept people on their own terms and that that comes through a lot of pain and personal experience but uh for us what we've just sort of seen is the good now that can be done um is 
really been able to look at somebody and not only say, I, I love you, but I also, I, I can accept and support the path that you choose because it used to be, I had a point in my life where I was like, if you're choosing a path that is not staying and being an active member of the church, I can't really accept that. Like, not, not good enough. I can't accept that. <laughs> and to get to a point where I say, I, I can because I just can't deny that there's goodness everywhere and that you might go and live a life that has nothing to do with the church, but it might, it can absolutely be a good life. Yeah. And be as happy as mine or be as valid as mine. And so. Well, and can so, I say to religious people too, members or even other denominations, the path that we are trying to live and that we are taking, there's good and bad in it too. We're not, you know, we're all just trying to do the best that we know how with what we have and to do the most good that we can. I don't think that, I mean, if I want somebody to accept the path that I'm taking, then I have to trust that they're just trying to do the best that they know how to and respect each other for that. Amen. 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 Yeah. Okay, so I have another question. I know we're supposed <laughs> to be wrapping up. we're supposed to be stopping. But <laughs> but we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Pardon? I said we, we'll go all night, but it's your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so you did Man on the Street interviews uh, at the Mass Resignation. Um, I would like, I'd like to hear maybe some of the stories that you heard there, if you can share, you know, briefly, uh, and then also talk about what you asked everybody to say at the end of the interviews. Okay, yeah. So, I, we, I mean, so I decided to, to, to record the event because I didn't want people to forget about this event. Mm -hmm. This is just such an important moment in, in the history of our church, good, good and bad. I mean, this is the opportunity now to really um, to make a stand. It gives us a talking point which to, I think, sort of bounce off of, um, if that makes any sense. Um, and like anything, it tends to sort of fade. So what I want to do is say, I'm going to be there anyway. We're going to be participating. But uh, again, when you hear people's stories, when you hear their voices, uh, it makes a difference, and just, you know, the people that we talk to across the board, um, there's so much humanity, and it was just uh, so good to see all of my expectations, even though I was there to resign, I still had expectations about what a person is like if they're choosing to do this, you know, that they're sort of shifty, or they're lazy, or they just didn't care, they just don't, you know, this is just nothing, they haven't been active ever, so what do they care? Mm -hmm. I saw the exact opposite. People that cared very much. Um, people that were hurting so bad and it was just like these, a pain that was too, too hard to, to ignore any longer. You know, when you hear people that, um, couples that now were, were forced, it was absolutely in stone. They had to either be excommunicated or make this step. Um, Parents who are like my my child is is gay and they're going to have children one day. Like what's going to happen to them? And they thought they were going to be able that they didn't have to deal with the issue for years. You know, I'm like I've got a 12 year old. <laughs> like I don't have to deal with this for at least another like eight years or something like that. And suddenly it was like, oh no, I have to deal with it right now. Um, and there are people that love the church. There are people that were like, no, I've been done with it for a long time. There were people that were really angry. There are people that were just really sad. And overall it was um, it was all people that sort of unified unified feeling was one of of love and acceptance and positivity. That was the thing that I was really impressed with is that people kept it on the level. There wasn't like sort of naysaying on the church. It wasn't it wasn't, you know, making fun or cussing them out or anything like that. Um it was it was a really positive event, which was really exciting. And the thing that we had them say at the end of each interview was something that had come to me as a really powerful inner moment um, not that long ago. It was about a week prior. And it was this little phrase, and it said, It's okay. You are loved. You can go. And that came to me. That was something that I was, as I was pondering this stuff and we were already considering leaving and we were considering what to do. It was like this little 
I don't know, this little voice of approval inside my head, this little permission that was being given to me, I guess for myself, that was saying, it's, it's okay, you are loved, and you can go, and all three of those things suddenly became so true in my heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just thought, man, this is, this is something that, that really impacted me, and so as we went and we talked to these people and interviewed them, we had each person say it if they were comfortable, and everybody was universally, and just made, it made me feel really good to see that it also had an impact on others because I think it did. Did you see any active members there to, out there to, to show love or was it mostly people just resigning? No, there was lots of active members. Okay. We actually interviewed a, a couple of them and there was quite a few that we talked to that didn't want to go on record for semi-obvious reasons. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, definitely active members that were willing to, to show love and and that for me again was a huge sea change. Like hearing hearing Naomi I mean, say what say what you said. I mean that's something I never would have contemplated or would have thought I could have heard at a certain point in my, my career in the church that there could be an acceptance of people willing to walk this path and and I think that's huge and I think that's really important. That the stigma of I mean apostate, that's what we technically are. Rachel and I are apostates, that's what we're marked as, and that's a harsh word. But it's not harsh when you know us and when you talk to us, and I think it's removing that stigma and members that are willing to do that is so huge. Yes, thank you. Okay, so now we will wrap it up. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, guys. Yeah, thank you. Guys, this is a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I wish you lived closer. <laughs> I know, we'd love to have you come Get together and have cookies. Christmas scene. Maybe we'd it. actually talk and like families. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just a really quick plug at the end of the, for the end of the podcast. Uh, we do have a Patreon website and I've had some requests, um, to set up a PayPal. And I mentioned this before and I'll, and I will keep banging this drum. I am very new at this whole internets thing, interwebs thing, um, trying to get this stuff set up. So be patient and, um, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, but your donations are very much appreciated. Um, they go a long way to help out the podcast. So anyway, thank you guys for joining us. Until next time. Yeah, I'll stop this.
It's getting darker, I will start a little fire just for you As the world is getting darker, I will start a little fire just for you